Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you for joining us, the final panel of this very necessary and unifying Defending Baltics Conference. Uh, I think we're going to have a very dynamic and insightful conversation on how the European defense industry is adapting to the urgent and evolving demands brought about by the war in Ukraine. In the past few months, the urgency to adapt, innovate, and scale up production has never been more palpable. Today, we'll delve into how leading companies in the defense sector are navigating this complex environment, balancing rapid innovation, increasing production capacity, and fostering cross-border collaboration to modernize Europe's defense infrastructure. Each of our panelists brings a wealth of experience and knowledge to this discussion, representing key players in Europe's defense sector. So I'd like to introduce our esteemed panelists. We have Mr. Harry Hinonen, Key Account Director for Estonia and Lithuania at Patria Global Division. Mr. Hinonen plays a critical role in strengthening defense ties between Patria and the, and the Baltic states, particularly at a time when ground warfare capabilities have come into sharp focus due to the war in Ukraine. His insights on how Patria is supporting regional defense efforts will be invaluable today. Mr. Kude Lona, Vice President of Government Relations and Business Development at Kungsberg. With extensive experience in both business development and government relations, Mr. Lona will provide a unique pers perspective on how Kongsberg is scaling up production and enhancing collaboration across borders to meet growing security demands across Europe. And at the end there, we have Mr. Peter Nygren, Director of Business Development at BAE Systems Haglands. Mr. Nygren leads business development efforts at one of Europe's largest defense contractors, and his strategic insights on innovation, production, and modernization will help us understand how a major defense player is adapting to this rapidly evolving landscape. So let's look at the big picture first of all. Last week, there was a powerful op-ed in the Washington Post by former U.S. Defense Secretary Robert Gates. He argued that even America, with its vast defense budget and innovation, cannot make the weapons it needs in time. With that in mind, I'd like to ask each of you, how would you assess Europe's ability to ramp up defense production? Are we moving fast enough to meet the demands created by the war in Ukraine? And are there obstacles we still need to overcome? We can start with Peter on the end, please. Yeah, it, it is a, a challenging time uh, and we, we see a, a demand that is increasing enormously and uh, we have a, a number of customers knocking on our door uh, wanting to, to procure uh, equipment from us. Is it possible to meet uh, the demand? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, we at uh, BA System Haglunds, we have invested heavily uh, and uh, with close cooperation with other uh, nations and, and, uh, and partners uh, across uh, Europe. We've been able to, to increase the, uh, the production capacity up to, to 500% actually. Um, but uh, the obstacle, I would say, is very much in the process uh, of uh, coming to a contract and uh, bringing down complexity. Because complexity and the process, the procurement processes, is sometimes uh, uh, killing us uh, in, in, times of, in terms of lead time. So I would say uh, we need to look through the, the processes on how to, to come to a contract without compromising on quality or delivery times, but harmonization uh, among uh, nations coming down to actually accepting. Uh, the latest build standard as the point of departure, and then you can take it from there and, and do upgrades. So, yes, we can do it, but it's, uh, it, it's challenging. Do you want to go ahead? Yes. I think it is interesting to actually analyze and compare the US markets and the European market in the context that in Europe we have many nations, it's a fragmented market. It's not an internal market, it is a competitive market. Whilst in the US you see one market in general with few suppliers, 
we had a panel earlier today talking about uh, manufacturing one or two variants of uh, uh, tanks, of two, one or two variants of infantry fighting vehicles, etc. Whilst in Europe you find 10 times more variants. But that does not mean that we automatically have a disadvantage in Europe because I believe and have experienced that there is much more innovation and much more pace in the European market, even though there is much more national concerns and focus on national solutions, just like in the US. But the size of the US uh, often dictates the American and the American industry in such a way that it is hard to innovate. You need government uh, initiatives, funding, profiles to take out and research and do changes. Mm -hmm. Whilst in Europe, the ownership of technology often sits with the industry, with the companies. Whilst in the US, the ownership of technology often sits with the government. So we have more flexibility in actually doing changes, adapting. But still, we are quite fragmented compared to the US. That's a very interesting perspective. Mr. Uh, Heinonen, um, your CEO, Essa Rautalinko, has noted that besides Finland, only the Baltic states and Poland have adequately prepared for ground warfare and invested sufficiently in artillery capabilities. The wake-up call due to Ukraine has simply been felt in certain places. What specific steps is Patria taking to support these countries' defense needs, and how has Ukraine shifted your procurement and production strategies? Uh, Patria is actually a, a huge company which is responsible for defense material and technology. Uh, and uh, in my comments, I'm focusing in, in the Patria lands products, which means the uh, armament and uh, vehicles, 6x6 vehicles and 8x8 vehicles, which we are selling abroad. Uh, actually, we didn't change our production too much of the, after the war in Ukraine started because we have had the same kind of uh, production processes going on for decades actually. And uh, when we get the orders from the customer, we start the manufacturing in, in Finland, in Hamelinna. We, we are uh, producing the pre-series in there and uh, mainly the customers' mechanics, they are studying the processes in our own factory. And uh, after that, we are transferring the production technology uh, into the customer country, if they need it. So that's the way how we have done it, and we did it uh, since the early 80s. So we didn't have to change the processes on be because of the war in Ukraine. So this is a choice? Yes. Okay. Um, but let's talk about scaling anyway. Prussian General Clausewitz is quoted as saying, the enemy of a good plan is the dream of a perfect plan. With the war in Ukraine driving demand for military assets in Europe, what are the biggest challenges your companies face in scaling up production to meet the needs of the countries on the eastern flank? Yesterday, Major General Remigius Baltrena said it's imperative to strike a balance between the quality and quantity of technology. How are you balancing this increase with maintaining quality and timely delivery? Where to start? Anybody <laughs> wants to start can start, please. Uh, this is a big question. Mm -hmm. And I think the answer varies a lot with what type of company you actually ask. Uh, we represent different types of companies with different uh, backgrounds and with different competences. For my company, uh, we come from a high cost country. We are originating and headquartered in Norway with a high cost level. Mm -hmm. So our focus has always been on high tech, high competence, uh, complicated systems, if I might say. So we are not rigged in actually making cheaper or simpler solutions. So one example was discussion here on drones. Why don't we make more drones? Well, we could, but we probably can't. At least not as cheap and fast as other startups and others who are focused on that task. So we need to, good, we need to be good at what we do. So similar to uh, Patria and BAE Heglunds, we are investing heavily and tripling and quadrupling our production capability, building new factories. 
And since it is high-tech solutions, we have a range of suppliers which we are completely dependent on. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, we need to have control of all suppliers, all from the mine extracting the minerals through the logistic chain until it ends up in our plant, we put it together. So it's a huge task and uh, scaling is a very difficult question but I believe we are succeeding for what we do. I don't know if uh, the audience have noticed that we over the last few weeks have uh, announced new factories, both in the US and also in Australia, which will double several times the capacity of what we do, our products. So we are willing to invest in what we are prior prioritizing and focusing on. Uh, what comes to plantry, for example, if I use the example as our 6x6 vehicle, uh, which we used to produce only in Finland in the, in the very beginning, uh, we just opened a new factory in Latvia for those vehicles. Mm -hmm. And we doubled actually the cap capabilities which we can manufacture. So uh, yearly today we can manufacture almost 200 vehicles. And what it needs from the suppliers and the subcontractors, it needs uh, that, that we have ensured the whole network behind our own production. And without those tasks, we are not able to take care of the delivery times. So we have to be sure that we can get the, the parts which we need in the production. Mm -hmm. Logistics, super important yeah. as well. And Peter, you have anything to add to this, please? Yeah, um, 16th of January this year was a, a very important uh, date for, for Heglunds. We had the privilege of having four uh, chief of army visiting us uh, up in Örnsköldsvik. It was uh, uh, Denmark, Norway, Sweden and Finland that uh, jointly came to us. Um, we had a filled order book, more or less sold out until 2030, and I was expecting us to talk about the future, uh, what, what are the demands. But the customers were quite clear that, yeah, we're interested in the future, but it's here and now that's important, and we need deliveries. We need deliveries when we don't have the capacity. So very quickly, we went to our owners, got some more investment, talked to our uh, partners, and we're able to increase the, the capacity uh, of production. But it doesn't stop that there. Uh, in order to be able to deliver, we need to bring down complexity. You cannot come with four customers simultaneously with national specific requirements. We need to, to, to bring this down to one Nordic configuration, and that actually help the, uh, the customers long term as well, because you will not only be interoperable, you will be interchangeable, because the crews from the different nations will know the vehicle because it's, it's more or less exactly the same. So um, our task now is to find a way and navigate to a contract where the harmonization is done. And we try to do it from, from below, and there's a, there's a strong uh, push from, from politicians, and they've, they've agreed that this is the right way to, to go. Now we need to make things happen. And it does not only come down to industry, it comes down to the procurement agencies aligning and understanding. If time is of essence, we cannot work exactly the way that we've done before. We need to, to cooperate cross-border much yes. more. Cross-border challenges. Mr. Looney, you wanted to... Yeah, I think Peter's uh, argument is really important yes. uh, because um, nations, they have their established processes, which they have established through three decades of deep peace. So the processes they're following is designed to actually do the process, not necessarily to acquire and get the equipment in-house as soon as possible. So the process is laid, it is approved by the political leadership and their parliament, and they have to go through these steps. They have to document each step, which is natural. So how can we uh, assist them in maybe, uh, what do you call it, jumping some hurdles, do things uh, faster? And that's a very good example, which you are alluding to, that it would be fantastic 
if, if, if one nation selects one product, it might be good enough for another country to tie in, and then maybe for a third country to tie in without doing the full competitive process in, in each country. And in that way, we can maybe uh, come in the back door, so to speak, not having the political leadership to dictate harmonization and standardization of equipment. Powerful ideas. I hope the right people are listening. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just what Peter said about standardization of, of the, for example, vehicles. Uh, sometimes it's hard for the customers to understand that if they need to have some changes in the configuration which we are producing at the moment, it needs always the redesign, and that takes time, that takes money. After the redesign, we, there might be some calculations which has to be done, and uh, then it might even have uh, some effects in the subcontract Contractors, tasks and work in the supplier network and so on. And every change in the configuration will always cause some delays mm -hmm. in the delivery time. Mm -hmm. No question. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about innovation because we talked about Europea, Europe being a little more innovative than America. Interesting perspective. <laughs> Not sure if I agree with that, but. Uh, <laughs> Clayton Christensen's theory of disruptive innovation uh, is more relevant today than ever in today's uh, defense industry, I would say. In his book from 1997 called The Innovator's Dilemma, he explains how smaller companies with fewer resources can successfully challenge established businesses by targeting overlooked segments, offering more suitable functionality, and gradually moving up market to challenge the industry leaders. We see tech companies that weren't even around a few years ago now shaking up the military tech landscape with AI and autonomous weapons systems, companies like Anduril and Palantir, or even Helsing here in Europe. They're rapidly securing contracts that once went to giants like Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman. How is this affecting the competitive landscape in Europe's defense industry? And are you feeling pressure to accelerate innovation, to keep pace with these fresh start, you know, startup unicorns? Or are you collaborating with them or are you competing with them? I can uh, vouch for, for Heglens that we, we welcome this development. Uh, we are a system integrator. We, we make vehicles that, uh, that we integrate subsystems uh, uh, into to, to get new capabilities built into to our, our system. So our core is actually to implement new capabilities. Um, and uh, we've been working towards uh, companies like, like ourselves with long processes. But, but now when we have sub-suppliers that come, come up with faster uh, deliveries, we welcome it. And we take it to our user community. We have 10 user nations that we regularly meet and talk to. We bring up the idea, this is a new technology that we have discovered. Uh, what do you think of this uh, from the customer perspective? If it's interesting for them, then we look uh, at the plan, how to implement it. Because the, the platforms of today are constantly being upgraded in order to meet the new threats. So uh, more innovation. Hooray. So Go you're able to pick and choose and integrate the best. Absolutely. Okay. So I say in, in uh, partners processes, we are using the technology transfer, which means that, of course, we need the partners from the customer country. And uh, we welcome the new companies, of course. But I've uh, been here, for example, in Lithuania to, uh, for speaking to scale with. Okay. Scalable. The venture capital company Scalewolf yes. that invests in defense. Yes. yes, and I say to those new companies to, uh, that uh, sometimes you are going ahead full speed and you forget something which is quite important and it's marketing. Marketing. Yes, you might have very good products, you might have very good innovations, but don't forget to market those and how you can do it you take care that your websites are worth of reading. Hear that, startups? We, we will Google you. They Google you and make sure that your websites are working and are up to par. Mm. Okay. 
We had a very interesting lunch discussion just an hour ago, and we agreed that we are a perfect example of the established defense industry. See, gentlemen in the 50s uh, with the gray hair and a tie, you do not find many startups here like us. They are younger, they are different. So it is important to actually value the differences between cultures and, and industries. Because we, as I, at least my company, is a, you know established industry. We, yes. as I said, we do what we do is high tech, is complicated stuff. We can't do all these things which the startups are engaged in, mm -hmm. but we can support, we can involve, we can motivate. Do you we invest? Can, we can invest, okay. absolutely. So, uh, so together uh, we can find these uh, solutions. And just like uh, Peter says about Heglins, we are also an integrating uh, company. We, we pick, for example, drones. We don't make drones, but we use them as sensors and effectors in our systems. As a matter of fact, years ago, we evaluated very closely whether to enter into the draw market or not, but we found out it's not for us, so to speak. We're not that type of company. It's hard to change a large industry to become something very different. We'll get to drones still, I think, but um, I, I'd, I'd like to just dive down a little bit deeper into this um, idea of how you work with uh, startups and uh, how you find those startups. Uh, incidentally, yesterday there was a Financial Times article outlining that uh, American venture capital funds are providing the lion's share of investment to European defense tech startups. So that's very interesting. But how are you investing and actually working with these startups? And is it more you're going out, like don't call us, we'll call you? Or are you inviting them into uh, your facilities in order to see how you might be able to integrate with them? As I said, in, uh, in Patria, we, we usually start to find out the new solutions and the new subcontractors, suppliers by using the internet. The internet? Yes, it is. So just One Google search. Okay, yeah. all right. Okay. And I would add, add to that because we do exactly the same. We have a special department that, that monitor and, and try to, uh, to, to see what, what kind of new technologies are out mm. there. But, but it's also very often that we meet them when we are at trade shows uh, uh, like uh, DCI or Eurosatori. They, they come and visit us and, uh, and uh, we, we listen in to what they, they have to say, have to, to judge, is this fit for purpose for us? So uh, I would say that we're, we're, we're quite active. And then equally when, when we've been uh, engaging in, in a new country where, where there are industrial cooperation requirements, we scan that country and, and to see what, what kind of uh, collaboration could we find here in order to meet the expectations that we actually uh, uh, interact with local industry. So I would say there are three buckets uh, where that, that we're looking to, internet, trade shows, and then scanning a, a specific country. Kongsberg might be a bit different. Okay. Uh, we have a broader technology for portfolio, product portfolio, from ground-based air defense systems to land systems, remote weapon stations, autonomous solutions. We do... Um, we do uh, submarine solutions, we are in the air, we're in space, we're you on name the it. water. You it's, name it's it. a huge portfolio mm -hmm. of technologies coming together. Yes. So we have a what we call a technology board, mm -hmm. which is responsible for keeping an eye on what are we doing, what, are, what do we need, do we lack something, is there some, what direction does technology evolve into? Where do we kind of uh, prioritize? And they're also responsible for, how to call it, sniffing mm -hmm. the, uh, the, uh, the outside world, so to speak. Are there any new technologies, any startups, any industries which we're interested to learn more about? Maybe we can acquire some, maybe we can invest in some. We want to be much better at this uh, forward. As the company grows and the portfolio grows, both wide and deep, we need to do this even more forward. We have done some, and the non-avionics example yes, here in Lithuania, Lithuania is yes. one example. We, we, we have been in the space segment for years, and we have a good foothold in different sectors. 
but we believe that space is a coming area of great interest. So we acquired a majority stake in Avionics here in Lithuania two years ago, which is established by two or three gentlemen back in 2014 and in a garage somewhere yeah. and has grown to a 200 men strong company just outside uh, Vilnius. So they do what they do and we put it into the Kongsberg portfolio and we believe we can uh, grow Nanavionics even further, being an integral, important part of our space activity. So that's maybe one example of how we can uh, work together with uh, smaller SME type industries. Fantastic. And uh, yeah, we're very, very happy about that. I have one example from the real life regarding the, the uh, production of 6x6 vehicles in, in Latvia. Uh, when we decided to, to establish a factory in Latvia, we went through uh, over 20 Latvian companies, which we first checked out from the internet. Then we visited those companies physically in Latvia. We had the same questions to each other company. And after that uh, physical check, we made a total summary of those companies and we chose a few of those. And then we took those companies to Patria's business process selection process in which we checked the background of the company more, more detailed. Uh, we checked the compliance things and that kind of things. And uh, afterwards, there are still few companies who are our business partners at the moment in Latvia. They are our subcontractors and very valuable for us. Okay, fantastic. Peter, any interesting innovation you've seen lately that you'd like to share with us? Um... Not that I can come up with right now. Okay, well, I think that some of these were very, very good examples. So uh, thank you very much for that. Um, let's now switch over to drones, since we said we would, and new technologies. Uh, Harry, uh, you had said drones will win the battle, but not the war. And certainly we've heard that being echoed the last kind of day and a half. Yet... We see how, for example, USVs have given Ukraine the ability to achieve an unimaginable level of sea denial using satellite communications technology together with drones. How are your companies incorporating these new technologies uh, into defense strategies? How do we prevent these technologies from being used against us? The issue with Russia using Starlink comes to mind as an example. And how do we see drone, satellite, and laser technology evolving over the la next few years since you're integrating a lot of these into your own platforms? Patria is actually a, a platform producer when it comes to the vehicles. So we have just started a new, new pro uh, project regarding drones, combining the drones to, to our vehicles. But uh, I don't have any further information regarding that one at the moment. Okay. So it's uh, more or less depending on the customer nations, what kind of solutions they will create uh, together with our, our vehicles and, and the drones which they are using. But as I said, the, the, you, can, you can win a battle by using drones, but you don't win the war by using drones. If you win the war by using drones, the war in Ukraine should have been over. Thank you. And Heglund's been uh, working uh, with drones for uh, a number of years uh, together with our existing customers. Uh, it started off uh, using uh, drones to, to be a reconnaissance for the vehicle. So you send out the, the, the drone ahead to understand what does the landscape uh, look like. When, uh, when the Ukraine war started, we, uh, we realized that uh, drones uh, were a bigger threat than, uh, than identified earlier uh, towards uh, our, our vehicles. Um, so we, uh, we've been together once again, together with our customers, uh, identifying on how, how should we uh, approach this. And by combining some of, of uh, the subsystems at, um, at, uh, the, with the CV90, we, 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 we will be able to detect them, uh, the drones, and then we, uh, we have a very effective uh, uh, anti-air gun on, 
built into the CV90 because that was part from the beginning uh, uh, when, when CV90 was designed to be able to shoot down uh, uh, flying objects. So um, we're working very closely with the existing customers to find the solutions to protect uh, uh, the vehicle uh, from, from the drone threat, dro drone threat. And at the same time, we look how can we implement it into our system to actually help us. So we work, work from, from both, ways, both ways, but important is for us to work very closely with the customers uh, because um, at the end of the day, they are the one who really know how these vehicles will be used. Uh, uh, so it's important to, to have that aspect. This is a big question, <laughs> because uh, drones are both an asset and they're a threat. Yes. You find them in the air, you find them on land, and you find them under water, and, and on water as well. Everywhere you are, exactly. Everywhere you are. Everywhere you are. So I think it is quite interesting to see how successful the Ukrainians have been, especially on the Black Sea, to deter the Russian fleet and pushing it uh, eastwards, Incredible. out of range, mm -hmm. with just small, cheap drones, maybe worth a few thousand dollars, inhibiting large billion-dollar ships. ships. This is definitely a lesson learned for the Western navies going forward. Incredibly important. But also the underwater domain with long-range underwater sensors and weaponized platforms is of high interest, which we should look at uh, forward. So when it comes to the aerial, which has been the biggest topic perhaps in this uh, conference as a threat, but also an asset, uh, there are so many aspects of it, and uh, I maybe should not uh, try to uh, be the politician in this picture, but it was interesting to listen to the major general from SHAPE uh, a couple of hours ago, who said very clearly that we sh what did he say? The words were something like, uh, what you see in Ukraine might not necessarily be the what we will see on our own battlefield, because we would like to fight on our terms. Mm. And which means that the drones will, of course, be a, have a position and a place in our possible future fight, but in a different way. So the experiences from Ukraine is highly important. So from company experience, you may... Um, have heard about the NASAMS system provided by Kongsberg and Raytheon, Norway and US to, uh, to Ukraine. It was delivered uh, quite uh, late in 22, and there's a lot of experience built into it uh, through these last uh, two years. So we have been able to change it and update it quite regularly as underway, as a matter of fact. But uh, it has uh, challenges with these smaller drones, the FPVs, etc. So we use technology from NASAMS and adapt it to using other weapons and sensors, not necessarily recognized as being NASAMS, but the same system. So in a matter of a few months, five, six months, we delivered a new type of anti-drone system to Ukraine based on a machine gun, 12.7, 50 caliber weapon with a sensor on a remotely operated weapon station, which is able to take down the FPV and smaller drones in the forward lines. But it's still NASAMS, it's still the same system. So we reuse technology we know, introduce new technology and mix it together. Very innovative. Uh, how are your organizations evaluating legacy systems in the face of new unorthodox threats like cyber warfare and hybrid attacks? Are you seeing governments ask for more advanced features that slow down delivery times that Peter had alluded to? Or um, kind of how do you address the tension, let me ask, between innovation and speed? Hmm. Well, when it comes to cyber, uh, there, there is a, a lot of requirements coming from our customers putting demands on, a, on it. And, and the cyber threat is here. So we need, we need to take that seriously. Uh, so I don't see that we can make too much shortcuts given uh, uh, the reality we're living in. So we, we need to take the cyber threat uh, uh, seriously in order for our, our systems to be hardened uh, uh, against it. Uh, but the more we learn about this, uh, the faster it will go. But of course, it, it slows down the process uh, a bit, but I think at the end of the day, it's needed that, that we don't uh, skip the cyber threat and, 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 and 
close our eyes and, and, and believe that it's not there, because it is. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the threats that, that we're facing. Thank you. Anybody want to add to that or? I think that there is no additional comments for that. Thank you. OK, <laughs> I thought so. Cross-border collaboration, let's get back to that. It's critical in meeting Europe's growing security demands. Yet we still operate in silos here. Working across borders comes with significant issues, regulatory, political, logistical, and so on. And you had come up with a perfect plan of how to uh, deliver a uh, one-stop shop to many governments. But how do you think we can truly translate that so that the right people are collaborating on the right levels? To me, it, it, it is all about uh, uh, trying to, to get the main message that if time is of essence, there is a consequence. And, and we need to, to adapt to, to that. And there is a political will uh, to cooperate more in the Nordic context. And I know mm. uh, uh, Baltics will be included into that uh, context. So there, there, is, there is a political will, but processes um, have not uh, really been adopted or at least used uh, uh, the, the last couple of years. So it's important that, that through, through leadership, the will of having fast deliveries come down to the working level so we can come up with smart solutions. It does not mean that we should cheat and, and, and uh, deliver something that is not as good. It means that harmonization of requirements will be key and also uh, use what is existing and, and look at the future for, for um, constantly upgrading the system, making it relevant. So it's the mindset that needs to flow down, uh, both in my organization, because our engineers, they love to, to uh, uh, refine something yeah. uh, and, and make imagine. it a little bit better. But that's not interesting now. Interesting is to give our soldiers vehicles uh, that, that, that works uh, uh, so they can do the job. It, it, it doesn't have to be perfect uh, in all aspects. Thank you, Peter. It's about the same in, in Patria. Uh, I always say to the customers that uh, when I tell you about the delivery times, I will tell you the truth. I don't want to lie you. I don't want to give you any promises which we can't fulfill. So that's why sometimes we might even lose the competition for our competitors uh, against our competitors because the delivery times might be even longer than, than theirs. But we have also seen the cases where the competitors have uh, promised delivery times which they know already that they cannot fulfill. So fair competition is fair competition, but I, I want to be honest, and Patri, I want to be honest towards mm. its customers. Very Finnish. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. It is. It is. Yes. Thank you. Unfortunately. <laughs> we're trying to angle the question a diff bit differently, coming back to the start, perhaps Please do. because uh, because uh, the defense industry is a, a closed market. Yes. It is not operating according to free market uh, principles. And you can just look at the statistics, especially well in the Western world. The big nations they buy from their own national industry. France, Germany, UK, the US, they have an import share of maybe 1% to 2% of the investment, the yearly investment budget, while smaller nations like Lithuania, Norway, Norway has an import share of approximately 80% in uh, average because we don't make the big platforms. We buy airplanes and ships and vehicles, etc., from abroad. And uh, for that matter, it is hard to harmonize, standardize, because it becomes a political question. Mm. So it was a very interesting conference uh, a month ago, approximately, the Nordefco semi-annual conference, which is a Nordic, uh, this was a Nordic defense industry conference where the political leadership of the Nordic countries came and the military leadership uh, came, and this topic was discussed. How can we harmonize? How can we do things faster? And the Danish military representative was very clear. 
Well, if uh, Sweden has chosen this, chosen this through a process, it's good enough for me. I'll buy it. Okay. And the Norwegians said, well, if, if, if the Finnish have selected this, it's good enough for me. I'll go for it. They said. <laughs> okay. So the question is, there is an intent and a will, but is there really a political possibility to do it like that? Because there are standard procedures that the nations need to follow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So intentions is one thing, and then actions will... We'll see how it goes. I think where there's a will, there's a way. We'll find it. Yeah. Uh, looking ahead to five to ten years, what key trends in the defense industry will shape the way your companies operate? And how should Europe prepare to face new and more integrated adversaries, for example, especially in terms of defense tech and infrastructure? The future. The future. If I, if I speak about uh, Heglunds, then um, I would say that uh, the change that I foresee is that um, the customization that our customers have been used to, they've been able to change the color of a screw or nut or whatever. We just follow what, what they want. Uh, I think those days uh, will be over because it will be more important uh, to, to um, have uh, uh, the systems delivered. Uh, and as we've been speaking about uh, harmonization and, and also if it's good enough for one country and they actually are fighting side by side uh, up in the Nordics. Uh, why? why should they have uh, different systems, etc.? So I think that will change the way uh, of, um, uh, of, of our business. And, and it will also change the way that, that we need to interact with the customers uh, long term. Uh, um, because there are so many benefits with this uh, uh, that, that it, uh, it will be hard to neglect that, that we should go this way. Oh, certainly on interoperability and Abs parts. And, and yeah. interchangeability. Interchangeability. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I, would, I would argue that, that um, um, uh, we, we see more collaboration in the future, and, and specifically in the Nordic and Baltic context. Since we are smaller nations, we need to cooperate, we need to find these way of, of, of doing things because it's important to get the deliveries, not the industrial setup as such. The deliveries uh, will, be, will be important uh, listening into this conference and many other conferences, uh, given the security situation. Anything to add here? You, you mentioned about the collaboration. Uh, at the moment, for example, Patria is your subcontractor in Estonia. Yeah. The armed forces ask for volume, mass, and shorter delivery times. The challenge is, of course, that currently our industry works under the normal principles of business economy. I mean, profit and loss. If we lose money, we need to let people go. We need to actually have a profit on what we do. So, it, so to actually be able to invest and to be able to beef up production and volume, we need a very close interaction with our customers, long-term perspectives, to be able to actually invest today for, vol for volume that uh, provides us stability and predictability for some time. How this actually will work out or will look like is very hard to say. There might not be a solution to this, but we need even better interaction with our governments in order to invest and, uh, and deliver what we are supposed to do, quantity and uh, shortened, shortened delivery times. Okay. Uh, do we have any uh, questions for Q&A? Thank you very much. Let's just take a look here. Yeah, we have a few uh, questions here. What are the biggest barriers to scaling up production? I think we covered that one. Um, how will Europe maintain its defense articles output once peace returns to the continent? How to make sure Europe does not become complacent again? Hmm. Please. 
Let's see, let's uh, imagine that we build many new factories because we need volume and mass now. All of a sudden, in some years, we don't need it. So the factories will be idle. Who will pay for that? Will mm. that be the company or will, will, will it be some type of combined uh, risk sharing with the government? That's always the big question. Yeah. Yes. Anyone want to add to that? Yeah, I think we do have the research and development department in Patria, which is just trying to, to figure out what kind of new vehicles we should sell afterwards, because we will have, there will be the day when our uh, existing vehicles will not be in, uh, in the baskets anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter, anything to add here? Well, I, I agree on the factory thing. Uh, to, to, to come to a country and, and build a factory, uh, to me, that's not the way forward. Use the existing infrastructure that is in that country and, 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 and make use of that. Uh, that. That would make it possible for, for long-term sustainability. Uh, so uh, uh, be wise on, on how we grow. That, that's needed. Uh, because when, when the war is over, I don't think the demand will, will drop down to where it was uh, five, six years ago, but uh, it will come down and we need to find a sustainable level uh, for us to, uh, to survive so we can grow again uh, if, if needed. Thank you. So I, I, with this, I'd like to uh, end our panel discussion and extend a heartfelt thank you to our panelists for sharing your expertise. It's clear that the European defense industry is at a pivotal moment, uh, facing both unprecedented challenges and exciting opportunities, hopefully to harmonize more. We hope today's discussion has shed some light on the path forward and spark, will spark further conversations about what we can do to strengthen our collective security. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.